Is there someone on the the Dutch team that you would consider a sort of a global superstar the way that there has been in, in years past? I mean, even sort of, you know, because there's been, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think right now, I'm, I'm, I'm horrifically blanking, but. I mean, um, I think the, I think the young, I think the young is a superstar. I, I, he's I the do. one that I would say. I, I think he is. Yeah, I, I think he's the one. I think the Licht is also a superstar um, on the world stage. I think those are, those are names that I know they're younger players under the age of 25, yeah. but those are players that I think most people who watch football in general know about. And it might have just because of the De Young PSG Barcelona transfer saga. That might be yeah. the thing that, that launched him into that echelon. But even going back to Ajax, he was one of those hot names that everybody in the world wanted, um, you know, yes. based on that performance. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's De Young, but De Young, yeah, he's not an exciting player. I think you're right. He's not a world beater. And it leads me to the point that the player that should be that, we'll say, famous, famous name, the big elite player, is Memphis Dubai, who for the English speaking world, I think is known, well, not here in America, but in the UK as being a, the burnout from Manchester United, who just didn't, who just fizzed out there and didn't work out. And now, I mean, people who watch a lot of football, including Liga, know that he revitalized his career. Memphis Dubai now is in his prime. He's 27 years old. And now if he was playing for Manchester United or for PSG or for Barcelona, uh, you know, that, yeah. I'm leading you here. Yeah. But if he was playing for one of those squads and he was doing what he did for Lyon last season, I think he would be considered a superstar um, because he's just been that important for Lyon. But you also saw against the Netherlands and you told me off air that you wanted to bring up Memphis and you wanted to bring up this game because you do have your reservations for a player that I think might be a Barcelona player by the end of the week. Yeah, I mean, by, <clears throat> by all accounts, I mean, the every indication is that, you know, People are talking about it like it's a foregone conclusion. So I'm kind of with the small caveat that it's not official. I mean, I have huge reservations about it for, for a couple of reasons. I mean, I think <clears throat> just I, I've been reading up on it and just kind of reading sort of. And I know some of the stuff that I read has been coming out of the, the English press. And, you know, when when someone from another nation goes to England and just kind of flames out spectacularly, you just kind of become a whipping boy in, in the mm -hmm. press and things like that. But even just reading back to, to things from early in his career when he was a PSV, um, you know, he was one of these guys that almost every quote about him was, he's kind of selfish. He's kind of a ball hog. He's kind of arrogant. I mean, yeah, he's super talented, but, you know, but there's always a but with him. And then there was, there was one thing I read, it's an old Guardian, you know, from like 2018. It's a Guardian article I just read this afternoon. It was like when he got to Manchester United, you know, Wayne Rooney pulled him aside and said, hey, you know, like, we're not going to do a lot of like flash and things like that. And we're, you know, just kind of just be be part of the team. We're going to we're going to keep it humble. We're going to keep it mellow. And apparently he showed up to training with like a Rolls Royce and a cowboy hat like later in the week. And even when he's been in France, he's regularly kind of called out teammates. I mean, he's had two. I guess we could say two and a half fantastic seasons with Leon because one of them was uh, truncated by injury. But, uh, you know, his first, I think his first season in Leon, he was fantastic. And then this, this past season, he was, he was excellent. But even in the midst of all of this, he, you know, you read the, the quotes from him in the press and he's regularly talking about, I should be playing every game. And, you know, when on occasions where the manager has, just put him on the bench, not just not drop him from the squad, but put him on the bench. He has, I mean, apparently he just, he tantrums. He sits on the ball on the pitch during warmups. If he's not starting the game, um, you know, he just, if the, there have been stories, you know, with uh, Leon teammates of his, you know, whether they're missing chances or missing passes to him or things like that. And he's kind of, he'll let them know about it in, in kind of a way that, you know, most, you know, you, you probably wouldn't want. And I mean, I think just between that and the fact that he's, I mean, he hasn't been, I mean, he was consistent this past season, but this past season is something of an outlier in that it was his first healthy and consistent season in four. And well, the my other butt, one. Well, I see my, my butt though is, while all those points are valid, I, I think he has yet to be, I don't know if he's ever been, yeah, maybe it's Wayne Rooney then when he was a younger player, but I mean, we don't know how much he's evolved behind the scenes. And now at Lyon, even if he's doing some of those things, 
I do push back on the idea that many players have done things like that. And then they entered the Barcelona dressing room and then things changed. Um, and we've seen a lot of different players once they've entered, once you're in Messi's locker room, it's a, some of those things just don't fly. And that's, and that's been the case. Uh, and if the younger players or even older players, like a Pianis, if it doesn't fit, then it doesn't fit. And so I think that's what makes your point valid. Is my, my, wasn't my, fear it's, my fear is it's Zlatan 2.0. But I don't think Memphis Dubai is anywhere the name cache that Zlatan does. And with Zlatan, he was literally too good to drop as far as like his name cache. Yeah. But for Memphis Dubai, if managers are willing to drop him at any juncture for personality, then obviously that Ronald Koeman would be willing to drop him. The only other thing I have is that because Koeman worked with him at, for the Netherlands, there might mm-hmm. be some trust there. There might be some, hey, this is what I need from you now. You're 27. Sure. It's time to be an adult. Uh, and if, yeah, I think Depay... Because we haven't spoken about his talent at all, we see even with the Netherlands, I think he's talented enough to make sense and fit with the team. But I have my reservations on his position. Just that yeah. free-flowing thing he does for the Netherlands, the free-flowing thing he does for Lyon, it does not fit with Messi. It did not fit with Griezmann. It did not fit with Coutinho. It, gosh, it didn't even fit with Zlatan, right? Like, it, it just hasn't fit. It doesn't work when you have a free-flowing player like that. And that's my concerns. Uh, it's really all in the field. Because I think for players off the field, more often than not, it's been sorted out by the leadership there at that club uh, and the expectations mm-hmm. that come upon you. And I, I said, you know, he was younger when he was at Man United. And if he's not taking well to being the guy at Lyon, um, I mean, again, maybe it's time to straighten himself out. Because even a Serginho Desk, I mean, he's a big, big personality. There's a lot yeah. of stuff coming out with him. Um, and you know that he's probably capable of, of Lyon moments. But I, in that locker room, he has to be a 20-year-old. He has to be the person that's going to follow. And yeah. I've noticed, too. I mean, I cover the team for the Twitch. I cover FC Barcelona. I work with them. And the desk that's on his own, you know, doing his own thing on his off-season or vacation or in the gym or whatever, the social media content that comes out there is much different than any of the content that comes out with him related to FC Barcelona. If you watch anything when he's interacting with his teammates or when he is on the premises – there is, he sound he seems like a quiet kid. He seems like he's a, right. a quiet kid. And then you look at him and you see how eccentric he is outside yep. of the team. Uh, and I think you could see a very different, uh, a very comparable thing with Memphis Dubai. Uh, I mean, I'm going to give you a final point on here because I do want to keep the show moving and talk about kind of the sure. one day, but. Yes, yeah, so my, uh, that, that point is actually very well taken. I think Dest is a really, really good example, especially compared to sort of young Memphis versus what, what Serginho Dest is now. I mean, I think the, the point that you kind of brought up and the, the, what gives me pause with Memphis is that Dest, I think he's, he's an eccentric guy and, you know, kind of outside of the, the context and outside of the, the, the confines of, of the Barca dressing room and the squad. But I, I, I've never gotten a sense that he sort of thinks he's... I feel like he knows what his station is at... Barca and his he knows his place on the food chain so I I think he's kind of very kind of well adjusted and grounded in that way my my concern is not that not that Memphis is going to come in and pretend that he's bigger than Messi but the problem that you know sort of he sees himself as a global superstar when he is you know a, a very talented player who is often very good but you know pretty often not as good as he thinks and, you know, kind of can, it can create friction and, you know, and obviously to bring him in, there are going to be, have to be there are going to have to be exits, which we've, we've talked about. So it's always a question of kind of who are you swapping out to bring in Memphis? Um, I just, I have pause. It's not that his talent is a problem, but uh, yeah. I and mean, I think positionally too, I mean, I think you can play him on the left because he cuts in onto his right, very well um if you give if you can kind of get him to he needs positional integrity where he kind of doesn't free flow but sort of stays there and plays to his strength in that sense i mean i think if he was just sort of a guy with that talent i think it would actually be it would be fine it's more the the not kind of x's and o's stuff that uh that gives me pause with him um along with the fact that it's already a relatively sort of jumbled and crowded attack not necessarily that it's super loaded but there's just so much of it that um kind of adding another potentially volatile or potentially kind of unsettling piece 
uh, gives me a little bit of pause. And I think we continue to talk about Fati. I mean, Fati yeah. does everything that the yeah. position needs to do if he was healthy. Uh, and if, yeah. if I'm, I've got, if I got Fati at hundred percent and I've got to buy at hundred percent for X and O's and what both bring, I'm starting Fati every single time, 10 of 10, Nemes Tobias is coming off the bench alongside Dembele and my starters are Messi and Griezmann and Fati, and we're figuring it out from there. Um, and what, as you mentioned, uh, with that attack being so loaded, that meant that, and we all have this feeling, yes, I'm biased, you know, with the American thing. I've been watching Conrad de la Fuente since he was 16 years old, 15 yeah. years old, you know, checking out highlights and just, you know, seeing what was up with him in the academy and watching him prosper and come through. And it was an awesome surprise to see him as the first American player to ever debut for Barcelona because he did it in a preseason game uh, last season before Sergio, uh, Sergino Dest ever came. So Conrad de la Fuente does get that. He wasn't an official match, but he does get the distinction of being the first American debut for FC Barcelona's first team uh, in, in, all, in all regards. That said, there is a sense that, yeah, he's too good for the third division, and that's true, uh, especially throughout the year. You know, last year he was pretty honest in saying that he had just one goal heading into March because he didn't enjoy being shifted between the, the first team bench and the back with the B team. He just wasn't getting consistent game time, and that was – certainly affecting him. He's a, he was at the time 19. Now he's 20 years old. So a young player, he might still be 19, whatever it is. Then he winds up scoring five in the remaining two months with Garcia yep. Pimenta when he was just with Barca B. He also collected all four of his assists of the season from February 21st on. So he's a player that was playing with confidence once he was down with the B team. And I kind of, I'm easily talked into the fact that this loan, it seems like to Marseille, they're still going over, how much the numbers may be, but it seems like this deal is almost done and dusted. It's a loan with 5 million euro clause to make the deal permanent in the summer for the French club. Can this new regime get those buybacks at reasonable numbers is the question I think is currently being asked because I think Conrad is one of those players that I would want to see a buyback clause inserted in 5 million euros. If he's had a good season, I think Marseille will easily purchase that amount, especially in the hopes that they have an American player and opening up an entire new market. So uh, there's also Marseille has a, a new American owner. So that is another fraction or another thing to think about behind the scenes. And next season, they're going to be in the Europa League with Jorge Sampaoli. You might remember he was a longtime manager. Yeah. We talked about Copa Bowl. Well, in, in South yeah. America, they know him well there. But he plays an attacking style and he defends as high as possible. So if Conrad were a defender, I'd be a bit worried. But good thing for Conrad de la Fuente, he is a winger and playing for a team that's playing in the Europa League. So Marseille, who finished, I think, seventh in Liga or fifth in Liga, something there this season, they are going to be playing a lot of different competitions. So I think there will be times for him to see the field. And, I, you know, it's, again, one of those plays in a long list of, of ones where I want to keep tabs because, yes, not every in front <laughs> I've said this a long, long time for years and years. If you get one or two players from every generation into the first team from the academy, you've done your job. And we're going to talk about Garcia Pimenta to end the show. Uh, yeah. But with the likes of, there was a talented group. There's a talented group that are not just, and this is no disrespect to a Sergio Palencia, who was a captain for the, for Barca B or Danny Moreira, another right back for Barca B, where you got the sense that they were never going to have a spot in the first team. Even if they right. become better professionals in their early and mid twenties, there was never really going to be a spot for them at the club. Mm -hmm. But then you had the likes of Aura Ruiz, who's now with Braga, uh, and then the opposite of that was Sergio Gomez, who was behind yeah. him, the attacking midfielder for Dortmund and now with Huesca, where Abra Ruiz seemed to just need game time and he's kind of figuring things out in Braga. Sergio Gomez, yeah. unfortunately, he's never going to be the player he was expected to be when he was 16, 17 years old when he made the move to Dortmund at 18. But then we also see a dad playing for their B team, probably their best player for the B team to help get promotion to the second division, Roberto Navarro. He's only 19 years old. That's a player that I'd say, hey, I want to keep calling him and reminding him where he got his start, right? And then you yes. have a player like Pablo Moreno, who's still, I think, 19 years old. He's bounced around from Barca to Juventus to Man City, and then he was on loan at Girona this year. Then in Girona, six matches, zero goals for him. And you're starting to not wonder, but again, he's only 19, 20 years old, so he still has plenty of time. And on the other, speaking of Girona, you have Manchu with eight matches and one goal this season. Manchu's kind of a good professional, but – was he ever an FC Barcelona first team or probably not? So no. Conrad is one of those players that I think could potentially be, but how often do you need to care about these buybacks? I think the, the best example right now, before I give it to you, Emil, is Jorge Cuenca, who was on loan yeah. at Meria from Villarreal. 
I thought he was one of the best defenders that I watched in the second division this year with Almeria. And I, he's a player that I'm glad that there's a buyback for how long yes. that you, you know, but Barcelona would have to get that. They have to make that deal sooner than later to bring him back before Villarreal have, you know, before he's no longer a Barcelona player with any buyback clause, he becomes right. a player outright without any buyback clause. But for Conrad, yeah, I would say whether or not Marseille, I hope they do spend the 5 million euros because that means he's earned that move. Uh, and then for Barcelona, right. if they can insert that buyback, then if you need to get him for eight to 10, because he's become one of the top, what, 30, 35, 40 wingers. Cause that's what really you're talking about. If you ever bought him back was yep. is he worth 10 million to 15 million. And the way that Barcelona are going to have to do business over the next five to 10 years. And this is the final point here. The yep. way that Barca have to do business over the next five to 10 years, even, uh, I mean, you could even say two to three, if you want to do the short term, they have yep. got to make shrewd deals and they have got to make sure when they bring players in or bring players back that they are getting them at value. And they might be looking down the pipe two years or three years from now and say that, hey, Conrad at 8 million euros is, is worth just as much as another talent who we're being charged 15 to 35 million euros for. And that yeah. is the reason why you put that buyback in. And that's why bars have to fight harder for it. Where I think over the last four or five years, there's been an idea that once a player leaves Barca, they're just no, they're they'd rather spend the 30 million to bring in yeah. a, a Trincao. They would. They'd rather spend 30 right. million to bring in another player that fits the same profile for more money because of yeah. whatever reason. But I don't well, think they're going to have the option now moving forward. Well, one, I mean, I think, you know, barring some sort of kind of financial gymnastics over the next couple of years, I mean, I think they just will not have that option. So, I mean, they're, you know, when a, when a guy leaves or, you know, someone underperforms or something like that, yeah, they, you're not going to have the option of going out and just – spending 30 million on two or three different guys and essentially almost taking this it's like a very bizarre version of like it's like a big money take on venture capital where like venture capital is you know they put small investments out and hopefully one of them is google and it just essentially you know pays for everything else that didn't work but like the these barcelona's and the one that i always go back to was um uh, now granted you know uh these, not all these guys are bad players, but I always go back to the, the transfer window where uh, I think they spent, what was it, maybe like 110 million on Arda Turan, uh, Andre Gomez, and um, Paco Alcacer. Yeah, Alcacer. Yeah, Paco Alcacer. And, you know, I mean, it was one of those strange things where obviously these guys were capable. They had done things. Like, they, you know, they, they were able bodied players, but it was, this, it was this weird thing that, you know, these were with the exception of kind of the, the mega transfers, these were some of the larger transfers that Barca had made kind of almost in their history. And these were just guys. It was just almost like stuff to throw at a, throw at the wall that you weren't assured that either tactically, attitude-wise, or just in terms of sheer talent, uh, they were... Um, they were ready and sort of ready and able to, to step in and do that job. So, I mean, I think these, there was a thing too. Now I know Juventus, I think was paying very high wages. I think that was the strategy, but I think one of the ways that they built part of this, the, you know, this last dynasty that they've had was they would get really talented players on free transfers and give them big wages because they weren't paying anything to, to actually bring them in. And I think it's, it's kind of like that where, I mean, one, it's going to be a little bit out of necessity, but secondly, I mean, I think you're reducing your risk. I mean, you're putting less, less money on the table. Like you don't have, you're not going to have transfer windows where you've wagered, effectively wagered, you know, 100, 120, 150 million euros on three or four guys. And, you know, three or four, and kind of the, the problem is too, it's three or four non-elite guys that, you know, are, are pretty good, but might may or may not work out. I mean, that's still that's just too much of a too much of a coin toss. And so I do think I think it's these buyback costs will be will be huge. I mean, I think it's obviously it comes down to negotiation and, and negotiating the right fee. But I think, like you said, I mean, I think a fifteen million dollar or a fifteen million euro buyback, right? Because you're getting five for him now, and then it's effectively is it going to be you know is it going to be worth ten million in whatever a couple of years? If he's that good, you will, you know, just you'll 
crawl, crawl through broken glass to, to, to sign a dude like that for, for 10 million. And rather than having to go through the entire kind of exercise of identifying a young prospect and, you know, negotiating with another team and absolutely not getting him for 10 million. So, I mean, I think these buyback clauses are going to be big. I think a little bit of it's going to come down, down to, I'm going to use a basketball analogy here, but it was kind of the, the thing that was always said about uh, Daryl Mooring, who was running the Houston Rockets, was, and ultimately it didn't work on the sort of to the championship level. But it, I remember the, the talk was always, he would win every transaction. You know, it was, yeah. you know, he would turn two second round picks into a useful functional rotation player. And he would turn two rotation players and whatever. So he was, and it's kind of like you said, you need to do shrewd business and there needs to be a long-term plan. But I think a lot of that long-term plan also needs to really involve um, minimizing as much as possible the, the swings and misses. And I mean, right now you just can't afford a big money swing and miss. So, you know, you kind of, like you said, you have to, you have to do shrewd you have to make shrewd deals and yeah, you have to get value for money and where you can, you try to get value for, for no money. <laughs> you know, if you can do, you can get someone for no transfer fee and a, and a relatively modest wage, that's a, worth, that's a risk worth taking rather than, you know, a, a midfielder who may or may not work out for, you know, 40 million. 